Chapter Three of the Thirty Nine Steps by John Buchan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Thirty Nine Steps by John Buchan. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Three. The Adventure of the Literary Innkeeper. I had a solemn time travelling north that day. It was fine May weather, with the hawthorn flowering on every edge, and I asked myself why, when I was still a free man, I had stayed on in London, and not got the good of this heavenly country. I didn't dare face the restaurant car, but I got a luncheon basket at Leeds, and shared it with the fat woman. Also, I got the morning's papers with news about starters for the derby and the beginning of the cricket season, and some paragraphs about how Balkan affairs were settling down and a British squadron was going to Kiel. When I had done with them, I got out Scudder's little black pocket book and studied it. It was pretty well filled with jottings, chiefly figures, though now and then a name was printed in. For example, I found the word Hofgard, Loonville, and Avocado pretty often, and especially the word Pavia. Now, I was certain that Scudder never did anything without a reason, and I was pretty sure that there was a cipher in all this. That is a subject which has always interested me, and I did a bit of it myself once as intelligence officer at Delagoa Bay during the Boer War. I have a head for things like chess and puzzles, and I used to reckon myself pretty good at finding out ciphers. This one looked like the numerical kind, where sets of figures corresponded to the letters of the alphabet, but any fairly shrewd man can find the clue to that sort after an hour or two's work, and I didn't think Scudder would have been content with anything so easy. So I fastened on the printed words, for you can make a pretty good numerical cipher if you have a keyword which gives you the sequence of the letters. I tried for hours, but none of the words answered. Then I fell asleep and woke at Dumfries, just in time to bundle out and get into the slow Galloway train. There was a man on the platform whose looks I didn't like, but he never glanced at me, and when I caught sight of myself in the mirror of an automatic machine, I didn't wonder. With my brown face, my old tweeds, and my slouch, I was the very model of one of the hill farmers who were crowding into the third-class carriages. I travelled with half a dozen in an atmosphere of shag and clay pipes. They had come from the weekly market, and their mouths were full of prices. I heard accounts of how the lambing had gone up on the cairn and the dooch and a half-dozen other mysterious waters. Above half the men had lunched heavily, and were highly flavoured with whisky, but they took no notice of me. We rumbled slowly into a land of little wooded glens, and then to a great wide moorland place, gleaming with lochs, and high blue hills showing northwards. About five o'clock the carriage had emptied, and I was left alone, as I'd hoped. I got out at the next station— a little place whose name I scarcely noted, set right in the heart of a bog. It reminded me of one of those forgotten little stations in the Karoo. An old station-master was digging in his garden, and with his spade over his shoulder, sauntered to the train, took charge of a parcel, and went back to his potatoes. A child of ten received my ticket, and I emerged on a white road that straggled over the brown moor. It was a gorgeous spring evening, with every hill showing as clear as a cut amethyst. The air had the queer rooty smell of bogs, but it was as fresh as mid-ocean, and it had the strangest effect on my spirits. I actually felt light-hearted. I might have been a boy out for a spring holiday tramp, instead of a man of thirty-seven, very much wanted by the police. I felt just as I used to feel when I was starting for a big trek on a frosty morning on the high veldt. If you believe me, 
I swung along that road whistling. There was no plan of campaign in my head, only just to go on and on in this blessed, honest-smelling hill country, for every mile put me in better humour with myself. In a roadside planting I cut a walking stick of hazel, and presently struck off the highway by a by-path which followed the glen of a brawling stream. I reckoned that I was still far ahead of any pursuit, and for that night might please myself. It was some hours since I had tasted food, and I was getting very hungry when I came to a herd cottage set in a nook beside a waterfall. A brown-faced woman was standing by the door, and greeted me with the kindly shyness of moorland places. When I asked for a night's lodging she said I was welcome to the bed in the loft, and very soon she set before me a hearty meal of ham and eggs, scones, and thick sweet milk. At the darkening her man came in from the hills, a lean giant who in one step covered as much ground as three paces of ordinary mortals. They asked no questions, for they had the perfect breeding of all dwellers in the wilds, but I could see that they set me down as some kind of dealer, and I took some trouble to confirm their view. I spoke a lot about cattle, of which my host knew little, and I picked up from him a good deal about the local Galloway markets, which I tucked away in my memory for future use. At ten I was nodding in my chair, and the bed in the loft received a weary man, who never opened his eyes till five o'clock set the little homesteader going once more. They refused any payment, and by six I had breakfasted and was striding southwards again. My notion was to return to the railway line a station or two further on than the place where I had alighted yesterday, and to double back. I reckoned that was the safest way, for the police would naturally assume that I was always making further from London in the direction of some western port. I thought I had still a good bit of a start, for, as I reasoned, it would take some hours to fix the blame on me, and several more to identify the fellow who got on board the train at St. Pancras. It was the same jolly, clear spring weather, and I simply could not contrive to feel careworn. Indeed, I was in better spirits than I had been for months. Over the long ridge of moorland I took my road skirting the side of a high hill which the herd had called Cairnsmore of Fleet. Nestling curlews and plovers were crying everywhere, and the links of green pasture by the streams were dotted with young lambs. All the slackness of the past months were slipping from my bones, and I stepped out like a four-year-old. By and by I came to a swell of moorland, which dipped to the vale of a little river, and a mile away in the heather I saw the smoke of a train. The station, when I reached it, proved to be ideal for my purpose. The moor surged up around it, and left room only for the single line, a slender siding, a waiting-room, an office, the station-master's cottage, and a tiny yard of gooseberries and sweet William. There seemed no road to it from anywhere and to increase the desolation the waves of a tarn lapped on their grey granite beach half a mile away. I waited in the deep heather till I saw the smoke of an east-going train on the horizon. Then I approached the tiny booking-office, and took a ticket for Dumfries. The only occupants of the carriage were an old shepherd and his dog, a wall-eyed brute that I mistrusted. The man was asleep and on the cushions beside him was that morning's Scotsman. Eagerly I seized on it, for I fancied it would tell me something. There were two columns about the Portland Place murder, as it was called. My man Paddock had given the alarm, and had the milkman arrested. Poor devil! It looked as if the latter had earned his sovereign hardly. But for me he had been cheap at the price, for he seemed to have occupied the police the better part of a day. In the stop-press news I found a further instalment of the story. The milkman had been released, I read, and the true criminal, about whose identity the police were reticent, 
was believed to have got away from London by one of the northern lines. There was a short note about me as the owner of the flat. I guess the police had stuck in that as a clumsy contrivance to persuade me that I was unsuspected. There was nothing else in the paper, nothing about foreign politics or Carolides, or the things that had interested Scudder. I laid it down, and found that we were approaching the station at which I had got out yesterday. The potato-digging station-master had been gingered up into some activity, for the west-going train was waiting to let us pass, and from it had descended three men who were asking him questions. I suppose that they were the local police who had been stirred up by Scotland Yard, and had traced me as far as this one-horse siding. Sitting well back in the shadow, I watched them carefully. One of them had a book, and took down notes. The old potato-digger seemed to have turned peevish, but the child who had collected my ticket was talking volubly. All the party looked across the moor where the white road departed. I hoped they were going to take up my tracks there. As we moved away from that station, my companion woke up. He fixed me with a wondering glance, kicked his dog vigorously, and inquired where he was. Clearly, he was very drunk. "'That's what comes of being a teetotaler,' he observed in bitter regret. I expressed my surprise that in him I should have met a blue-ribbon stalwart. "'Ay, but I'm a strong teetotaler,' he said pugnaciously. "'I took the pledge last Martimus, and I have na touched a drop of whisky sinny, not even at Hogmanay, though I was sair tempted.' He swung his heels up on the seat, and burrowed a frowsy head into the cushions. "'And thus I get,' he moaned, "'a head hotter than hell fire, and twain looking different ways for the Sabbath.' "'What did it?' I asked. "'A drink they ca brandy. Being a teetotaler, I kept off the whisky, but I was nipping a day yesterday in at this brandy, and I do I'll no be well for a fortnight. His voice died away into a stutter, and sleep once more laid its heavy hand on him. My plan had been to get out at some station down the line, but the train suddenly gave me a better chance, for it came to a standstill at the end of a culvert which spanned a brawling porter-coloured river. I looked out and saw that every carriage window was closed and no human figure appeared on the landscape. So I opened the door, and dropped quickly into the tangle of hazels which edged the line. It would have been all right, but for that infernal dog. Under the impression that I was decamping with its master's belongings, it started to bark, and all but got me by the trousers. This woke up the herd, who stood bawling at the carriage door in the belief that I had committed suicide. I crawled through the thicket, reached the edge of the stream, and in cover of the bushes put a hundred yards or so behind me. Then from my shelter I peered back, and saw that the guard and several passengers gathered round the open carriage door, and stared in my direction. I could not have made a more public departure if I had left with a bugler and a brass band. Happily the drunken herd provided a diversion. He and his dog, which was attached by a rope to his waist, suddenly cascaded out of the carriage, landed on their heads on the track, and rolled some way down the bank towards the water. In the rescue which followed, the dog bit somebody, for I could hear the sound of hard swearing. Presently they had forgotten me, and when, after a quarter of a mile's crawl, I ventured to look back, the train had started again, and was vanishing in the cutting. I was in a wide semicircle of moorland, with the brown river as radius, and the high hills forming the northern circumference. There was not a sign or sound of a human being, only the plashing water and the odd, interminable crying of curlews. Yet, oddly enough, for the first time I felt the terror of the hunted on me. It was not the police that I thought of but the other folk, who knew that I knew Scudder's secret, and dared not let me live. 
I was certain that they would pursue me with a keenness and vigilance unknown to the British law, and that once their grip closed on me I should find no mercy. I looked back, and there was nothing in the landscape. The sun glinted on the metals of the line and the wet stones in the stream, and you could not have found a more peaceful sight in the world. Nevertheless I started to run. Crouching low in the runnels of the bog, I ran till the sweat blinded my eyes. The mood did not leave me till I had reached the rim of mountain and flung myself panting on a ridge high above the young waters of the brown river. From my vantage ground I could scan the whole moor right away to the railway line and to the south of it where the green fields took the place of heather. I have eyes like a hawk, but I could see nothing moving in the whole countryside. Then I looked east, beyond the ridge, and saw a new kind of landscape, shallow green valleys with plentiful fir plantations, and the faint lines of dust which spoke of high roads. Last of all I looked into the blue May sky, and there I saw that which set my pulses racing. Low down in the south a monoplane was climbing into the heavens. I was certain, as if I had been told, that that aeroplane was looking for me, and that it did not belong to the police. For an hour or two I watched it from a pit of heather. It flew low along the hilltops, and then in narrow circles back over the valley up which I had come. Then it seemed to change its mind, rose to a great height, and flew away back to the south. I did not like this espionage from the air, and I began to think less well of the countryside I had chosen for a refuge. These heather hills were no sort of cover if my enemies were in the sky, and I must find a different kind of sanctuary. I looked with more satisfaction to the green country beyond the ridge, for there I should find woods and stone houses. About six in the evening I came out of the moorland to a white ribbon of road which wound up the narrow vale of a lowland stream. As I followed it, fields gave place to bent, the glen became a plateau, and presently I had reached a kind of pass where a solitary house smoked in the twilight. The road swung over a bridge, and leaning on the parapet was a man. He was smoking a long clay pipe and studying the water with spectacled eyes. In his left hand was a small book, with a finger marking the place. Slowly he repeated, As when a griffin through the wilderness, with winged step o'er hill and moory dale, pursues the Arimaspian. He jumped round as my step rung on the keystone, and I saw a pleasant, sunburnt, boyish face. "'Good evening to you,' he said gravely. "'It's a fine night for the road.' The smell of wood-smoke and of some savoury roast floated to me from the house. "'Is that place an inn?' I asked. "'At your service,' he said politely. "'I am the landlord, sir, and I hope you will stay the night. For, to tell you the truth, I have had no company for a week.' I pulled myself up on the parapet of the bridge and filled my pipe. I began to detect an ally. "'You're young to be an innkeeper,' I said. "'My father died a year ago, and left me the business. I lived there with my grandmother. It's a slow job for a young man, and it wasn't my choice of a profession.' "'Which was?' He actually blushed. "'I want to write books,' he said. "'And what better chance could you ask?' I cried. "'Man, I've often thought that an innkeeper would make the best storyteller in the world.' "'Not now,' he said eagerly. "'Maybe in the old days, when you had pilgrims and ballad-makers and highwaymen and mail-coaches on the road. But not now. Nothing comes here but motor-cars full of fat women who stop for lunch, or a fisherman or two in the spring, and the shooting-tenant in August.' There's not much material to be got out of that. I want to see life, to travel the world, and write things like Kipling and Conrad. 
The most I have done yet is to get some verses printed in Chambers' journal. I looked at the inn, standing golden in the sunset against the wine-red hills. I've knocked a bit about the world, and I wouldn't despise such a hermitage. Do you think that adventure is found only in the tropics, or among gentry in red shirts? Maybe you're rubbing shoulders with it at this moment. That's what Kipling says, he said, his eyes lightening, and he quoted some verse about romance being up the 915. Here's a true tale for you, then, I cried, and a month's hence you can make a novel out of it. Sitting on the bridge in the soft May gloaming, I pitched him a lovely yarn. It was true in essentials, too, though I altered the minor details. I made out that I was a mining magnate from Kimberley, who had had a lot of trouble with IDB, illicit diamond buying, and had shown up a gang. They had pursued me across the ocean, and had killed my best friend, and were now on my tracks. I told the story well, though I say it who shouldn't. I pictured a flight across the Kalahari to German Africa, the crackling, parching days, the wonderful blue velvet nights. I described an attack on my life on the voyage home, and I made a really horrid affair of the Portland Place murder. "'You're looking for adventure?' I cried. "'Well, you've found it here. The devils are after me, and the police are after them. It's a race that I mean to win.' "'By God!' he whispered, drawing his breath in sharply. "'It is all pure Ryder Haggard and Conan Doyle.' "'You believe me,' I said gratefully. "'Of course I do,' and he held out his hand. "'I believe everything out of the common. The only thing to distrust is the normal.' He was very young, but he was the man for my money. "'I think they're off my track for the moment, but I must lie close for a couple of days. Can you take me in?' He caught my elbow in his eagerness, and drew me toward the house. "'You can lie as snug here as if you were in a moss-hole. I'll see that nobody blabs, either. And you'll give me some more material about your adventures?' As I entered the inn-porch, I heard from far off the beat of an engine. There, silhouetted against the dusky west, was my friend, the monoplane. He gave me a room at the back of the house, with a fine outlook over the plateau, and made me free of his own study, which was stacked with cheap editions of his favourite authors. I never saw the grandmother, so I guessed she was bedridden. An old woman named Margit brought me my meals, and the innkeeper was around me at all hours. I wanted some time to myself, so I invented a job for him. He had a motor-bicycle, and I set him off next morning for the daily paper, which usually arrived with the post in the late afternoon. I told him to keep his eyes skinned, and to make note of any strange figures he saw, keeping a special sharp lookout for motors and aeroplanes. Then I sat down in real earnest to Scudder's notebook. He came back at midday with the Scotsman. There was nothing in it except some further evidence of Paddock and the milkman, and a repetition of yesterday's statement that the murderer had gone north. But there was a long article, reprinted from the Times, about Carolides, and the state of affairs in the Balkans, though there was no mention of any visit to England. I got rid of the innkeeper for the afternoon, for I was getting very warm in my search for the cipher. As I told you, it was a numerical cipher, and, by an elaborate system of experiments, I had pretty well discovered what were the nulls and stops. The trouble was the key word, and when I thought of the odd million words he might have used, I felt pretty hopeless. But about three o'clock I had a sudden inspiration. The name Julia Chekenyi flashed across my memory. Scudder had said it was the key to the Carolides business, and it occurred to me to try it on his cipher. It worked. The five letters of Julia gave me the position of the vowels. A was J, the tenth letter of the alphabet, and so repeated by X in the cipher. E was U, XXI, and so on. 
Chechenyi gave me the numerals for the principal consonants. I scribbled that scheme on a bit of paper, and sat down to read Scudder's pages. In half an hour I was reading with a whitish face and fingers that drummed on the table. I glanced out of the window, and saw a big touring-car coming up the glen towards the inn. It drew up at the door, and there was the sound of people alighting. There seemed to be two of them, men in aquascutums and tweed caps. Ten minutes later the innkeeper slipped into the room, his eyes bright with excitement. "'There's two chaps below looking for you,' he whispered. "'They're in the dining-room, having whiskies and sodas. They asked about you, and said they'd hoped to meet you here. Oh, and they described you jolly well, down to your boots and shirt. I told them you had been here last night, and had gone off on a motor-bicycle this morning, and one of the chaps swore like a navvy. I made him tell me what they looked like. One was a dark-eyed, thin fellow with bushy eyebrows, and the other was always smiling and lisped in his talk. Neither was any kind of foreigner, on this my young friend was positive. I took a bit of paper and wrote these words in German, as if they were part of a letter. Blackstone. Scudder had got on to this, but he could not act for a fortnight. I doubt if I can do any good now, especially as Carolides is uncertain about his plans, but if Mr. T. advises, I will do the best I— I manufactured it rather neatly, so that it looked like a loose page of a private letter. Take this down and say it was found in my bedroom, and ask them to return it to me if they overtake me. Three minutes later I heard the car begin to move, and peeping from behind the curtain caught sight of the two figures. One was slim, the other was sleek. That was the most I could make of my reconnaissance. The innkeeper appeared in great excitement. "'Your paper woke them up,' he said gleefully. "'That dark fellow went as white as death, and cursed like blazes, and the fat one whistled and looked ugly. They paid for their drinks with a half a sovereign, and wouldn't wait for change.' "'Now I'll tell you what I want you to do,' I said. "'Get on your bicycle, and go off to Newton Stewart to the chief constable. Describe the two men and say you suspect them of having something to do with the London murder. You can invent reasons. The two will come back, no fear. Not to-night, for they'll follow me forty miles along the road. But first thing to-morrow morning, tell the police to be here bright and early." He set off like a docile child while I worked at Scudder's notes. When he came back we dined together, and in common decency I had to let him pump me. I gave him a lot of stuff about lion-hunts and the Matabele War, thinking all the while what tame business these were compared with this I was now engaged in. When he went to bed I sat up and finished Scudder. I smoked in a chair till daylight, for I could not sleep. About eight next morning I witnessed the arrival of two constables and a sergeant. They put their car in a coach-house under the innkeeper's instructions, and entered the house. Twenty minutes later I saw from my window a second car come across the plateau from the opposite direction. It did not come up to the inn, but stopped two hundred yards off in the shelter of a patch of wood. I noticed that its occupants carefully reversed it before leaving it. A minute or two later I heard their steps on the gravel outside the window. My plan had been to lie hid in my bedroom and see what happened. I had a notion that, if I could bring the police and my other, more dangerous pursuers together, something might work out of it to my advantage. But now I had a better idea. I scribbled a line of thanks to my host, opened the window, and dropped quietly into a gooseberry bush. Unobserved, I crossed the dyke, crawled down to the side of a tributary burn, and won the high road on the far side of the patch of trees. There stood the car, very spick and span in the morning sunlight, but with the dust on her which told of a long journey. I started her, jumped into the chauffeur's seat, and stole gently out on to the plateau. Almost at once the road dipped, 
so that I lost sight of the inn, but the wind seemed to bring me the sound of angry voices. End of chapter 3